Okay, so on each of these sheets, there are four nucleotides, one of each of the types that are found in DNA. And if you want to make a double helix that makes a complete turn, you're going to need six of these sheets. Now it says here paper DNA, but I want to point out that this is actually cardstock, 110 pound cardstock. So keep in mind that you'll probably be really frustrated if you actually try to do this with standard paper because it's just not rigid enough. Okay, so the first step is to color the nucleotides and cut them out. And I've colored them with some colored pencils here. And once they have some color on them, we can see that there are three components in each of the nucleotides that we need to understand. The nitrogenous base, the deoxyribose sugar molecule, and the phosphate group. And on the four nucleotides, we find that the sugars and the phosphates are always the same, but the nitrogenous bases are different, as we can see from these letters here, and also from the fact that some of them are single rings of carbon atoms, and these are the pyrimidines, and some of them are double rings, and these are the purines. Now I've colored adenine and thymine here green to represent their complementary nature because they're always found together, and cytosine and guanine yellow for the same reason. And really you could use any colors you wanted, but I find that these primary colors work pretty well. Now, once the nucleotides are all colored, uh, then we need to cut them out by just simply following the lines around each one. And to show you how that looks, I've completed one here. Here's where I've made the cut, and this is the nucleotide. All right, now that these uh, nucleotides are all cut out, I need to make some additional cuts along the edge of each nucleotide on these lines that are marked out here. And this is so that I can use those cuts in order to make bonds to put these nucleotides together. Now the first area where we have some cuts is right here around the nitrogenous base. And the first two cuts are fairly simple, like so. But the third one's a bit complicated, and to do that one I have to fold this part of the base in half, and then cut across that fold so that when I open it up, flatten it back out again, I have a cut that's at an angle right there. The next group of cuts is right here around the, uh, the sugar molecule, and there's four of those, and the only thing that's uh, important about those is that the two outside ones stop at the edge of the ring, and the two inside ones continue in toward the center a little bit. The last cuts are right here around the phosphate group, and there are two that are fairly easy. And then the next two are a little bit harder to see, but they're also easy cuts. They're right here on the point of this part of the tetrahedron. And there, I've made the cuts. And you can see them from the other side as well. Okay, now all of my cutting is done, so I don't need these anymore. Next step is to make a fold, one single fold on each nucleotide right on that dashed line. Just like that. On all of them. Alright, now that the nucleotides are all cut and folded, we're ready to make some bonds. So I'm going to start by making a single strand of nucleotides because that's really the way that DNA is synthesized in a cell. We, uh, we separate a double helix into two strands and use each one as a template for making a copy by moving free nucleotides into position one at a time. So in order to make a single strand, I'm going to just pick two nucleotides here. Two at random. They don't have to be uh, complementary because we're going to make a bond called a phosphoester bond. Okay, and that happens when I bring together, let me clear these out here, I bring together the phosphate group from one nucleotide and the sugar from the next nucleotide, and I'm going to slide them together here so that the tip of the tetrahedron of the phosphate group is near the center of the sugar ring. So those slits fit together. Then I'm going to pivot these nucleotides so that I can push this little white point here through to the other side of the sugar and that engages that paper so that there's a fairly tight fit there. Okay. When I'm done with that, I'm going to use these other two slits by pushing this point right there through 
the slit to the back side and then doing the same thing over here but in this case it's pushing a point from the back side to the front. Now that's a strong bond and this is what it looks like from the back. One more thing that I, uh, I wanted to point out about this phosphoester bond is that it can actually be taken apart fairly easily without damaging the nucleotide and that's an important characteristic of DNA to understand. Um, also, if when you take it apart and put it back together for one reason or another, um, if after a while the, the material gets a little weakened or maybe if you made your cuts um, a little bit long or a little bit short and it didn't quite work out, uh, a small piece of cellophane tape right here on the back side will help to hold this bond together without any trouble. So now it's pretty solid. So to make my single strand I'm just going to uh, repeat this process a few times and I can, I can just see this as it would extend here like that. I'm going to repeat it keeping in mind that the one problem I might run into is that I have a limited supply of nucleotides here, not like the generous supply that I would find inside the nucleus of a cell. So, if I want to use all of my nucleotides, I just need to make sure that I use equal numbers of green and yellow uh, bases in my single strand. That way I will have the right numbers of bases for my second strand and I'll be able to use all my nucleotides. All right. Now I have a complete single strand of DNA and uh, some additional loose nucleotides here. And one of the things that I notice right away about this strand is that at one end I have an unbonded sugar molecule and at the other end I have an unbonded phosphate group. This end with the sugar molecule is called the 3' prime end because of this carbon right here and this end is called the 5' prime end because of this carbon right here. The, the fact that these ends are different is very important because it reminds us that this molecule is a polar molecule. It has some directionality to it. And when we start the process of building another strand of DNA using this one as a template, we need to know that we always start at the 5' prime end and work our way in this direction to the 3' prime end. All right, now it's time to learn another bond. The next bond we're going to learn is the hydrogen bond between one base and its neighbor on the other strand which makes them a base pair. And remember that we're starting here at the 5' prime end and in order to make this bond I need to select the appropriate complementary base which in this case is this one. To make the bond I'm going to simply turn this base over and I'm going to bring those colored surfaces together and then slide them apart making sure that as I do that I bring the, the slits on the sides here so that they hook into each other. And you see I can't pull that apart any farther. Once I have that into position, then we know there's a slit here at the top of this C and I'm going to just simply pop that to this side. And there's another one here at the top of the G. I'm going to pop that to the other side. And so now we have a fairly strong bond. Turn it over and we see it there. Okay, But even though it's strong, it's fairly simple to simply reverse the process and take it apart and we should point out that this is actually the easiest bond in DNA to break. In fact, all we have to do is heat the molecule up a little bit to do that. So this is the hydrogen bond. Alright, now I have uh, created two hydrogen bonds, two base pairs here at this 5' prime end of my template strand so that I now have the beginnings of what is going to become my second strand and I can start that process by just simply creating my phosphoester bond here just the way that we did it before. There we go. There we have the bond. And then I'm just, I can see that my, my base pairs are at a slight angle to one another and it's that angle that's going to make it possible for this structure to turn uh, as the double helix. All right, so now with all of my hydrogen bonds formed and all of my phosphoester bonds formed, I have a complete double helix DNA, which is 12 base pairs long. It makes one complete turn. Um, and since I have it here, I thought I'd point out a couple of properties of it that I think are pretty cool. 
The first is that it can be taken apart, which makes it like real DNA. But also, if we look at it uh, uh, at this type of angle, we can see that the colors here show us that these strands are actually in opposite orientation. And again, this is the anti-parallel polarity, which has a lot to do with how DNA functions with other molecules. Um, also, I want to point out that if we made more short strands like this, we could simply splice them together because the uh, the phosphate and the sugar groups are always in the right position here. Uh, so under the right conditions, we could extend this molecule. And also on the outer surface, uh, you might notice that there are some broad, shallow regions and some deeper, narrower regions. And these are sometimes referred to as major and minor grooves in DNA. And that means that there's a couple of different types of spaces that other molecules can interact with this one.